Hello, I'm Susan Willis, and on behalf of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, I welcome you to ASF Insights. This is our opportunity to talk about the work at ASF in broader cultural, literary, theatrical, whatever we want to do terms. Tonight, we have a special treat for you because we have Professor Elizabeth Woodworth with us. She is known to ASF audiences because she has spoken with the Insights program before. And she is known to Montgomery because when she took her PhD with highest distinction from Texas Christian University, she was lured to Montgomery <laughs> by the Auburn at Montgomery English Department. And it was a happy day for all of us at AUM when this occurred. She took her degree in 19th century English studies and in rhetoric, both of which fields AUM quickly put her to work in. She is a 19th century novel expert and she became director of composition at AUM for 10 happy years. Happy from our point of view at AUM. <laughs> and I think happy for Elizabeth as well. Oh yeah. Then she got lured westward, <laughs> westward, but just a little westward to the War College at Maxwell Air Force Base, where she is currently Associate Professor of Strategic Communication and Director of Research and Electives. So she's still doing all her expertise because she does a lot of rhetoric at Maxwell. And tonight we've got her talking about Dickens, a particular favorite of hers, a particular favorite of mine, and especially in conjunction with Greta Lambert's wonderful adaptation and performance. This is our pleasure to share with you some insight into Dickens and this wonderful Christmas work. Please welcome Elizabeth Woodward and Woodworth, and we are happy to have her with us. Elizabeth. Thank you, Susan. Susan was my uh, one of my favorite colleagues for 10 years at AUM, and I was so giddy when she called and asked if I was interested in talking about A Christmas Carol. First of all, I love Dickens, and I love A Christmas Carol, and I love Susan. So uh, along with the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, like... <laughs> That's a quadruple punch, right? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about A Christmas Carol. I'm going to share my screen and start my slides. And I'm going to contextualize Dickens just a little bit in the 19th century, but I'm going to make some connections between the pandemic that we're in and the kinds of epidemics and disease and health panics that he lived through in his lifetime. So let me share my screen. I named this talk, Literature in a Pandemic, What Would Dickens Do? Because we need stories. It's the thing that gets us through. And if you think about all the stories that have been told in times of trouble that have gotten people through those trouble troubles, a Christmas Carol is one of those things. It, holidays are tough for a lot of people. And Christmas Carol is one of the stories that always gives us hope, no matter what else is going on. So let me talk just a little bit about Dickens. This is his timeline. He is blue. He was born in 1812 and he lived until 1870. So kind of smack dab in the middle of the 19th century. You can see all of the other authors that lived during his time, the monarchs in England and also some of the really big events of, the, of his lifetime. What you don't see on this timeline is how many diseases happened in the 19th century. And there were many. In his lifetime alone, these diseases were incredibly prevalent. Smallpox, typhus, the bubonic plague, <laughs> um, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, Tuberculosis probably shows up in more literature than we even realize. Uh, anybody who coughs, they could have tuberculosis. We see characters in literature throughout the 19th century coughing. A little bit of blood appears on their handkerchief. It's TB. Uh, now, the smallpox was killing millions of people all over the world for many, 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 many years. It's estimated that about 400,000 people died per year from smallpox. 
from the beginning of time, perhaps, it's just wiping people out. Uh, even when there weren't that many people, a huge percentage of the population was wiped out that, by that disease. And we know that Native American tribes were wiped out nearly or altogether. The bubonic plague, millions of people died. And there wasn't a year between 1500 and 1850 when there wasn't an outbreak of the bubonic plague. And in fact, in 2017, an outbreak of bubonic plague erupted in Madagascar, killing 170 people. So these kinds of huge, big diseases, we think maybe we've gotten rid of them, but maybe we haven't. And so here we are in the middle of another one. Dickens would understand what we're going through. And one of the things that he would do is keep telling story. That's the kind of thing that he did. In his time, England was filthy. London was so grubby. When you think about this, perhaps traveling back in time, you think, oh, it's so romantic. I would love to go back in time and be friends with Dickens and drink port and eat big chunks of roast beef. Well, if you could get over the stench, you might be able to do that. There were no good sewers. Filth and human waste and animal waste and dead animals were all poured out into the street and they eventually find their way into the river that runs right through England. Not only could you find human and animal waste throughout the river, but any kind of plant trash, <laughs> old logs, uh, broken up, any kind of other horrible things, dead animals and dead bodies. It was one of the most polluted rivers in history. Now this is the capital of the biggest empire in the world. They eventually cleaned it up, but it was so bad at various times that it caused cholera outbreaks. And if you look at that blue part, the Thames River, down by Westminster Bridge, after the big curve down towards the bottom, you'll see the Houses of Parliament right by the river. The stench in the river was so bad, the pollution was so bad that they had to stop governing. <laughs> they had to leave London because they couldn't go to work anymore. Now, they tried to put in wooden streets to alleviate the mixing of the mud and the urine and the, the poop from the horses. And uh, it didn't work though, because the horse urine soaked right into the wooden slats and the stench of ammonia became so prohibitive. People couldn't walk down the streets for that smell. So it's really a smelly, dirty place. And I haven't even talked about the air pollution. The yellow fog of London was so thick and so noxious that if you did have tuberculosis, you weren't going to have it for very long. Same thing with all of the coal factories and the coal burning fireplaces throughout London. On any given day, you could have yellow fog, you could have black coal filled skies and horrible open sewers everywhere you went. And I'm not even talking about the cesspools that were in the backyards of most homes. It is not a clean place. And there's not a clear concept of what a germ is at the beginning part of the century. So really, really squalid. And of course, there's going to be a lot of diseases. And it's not just in London, it's all over the world that people are suffering from disease and pandemics. Cholera has an uptick in nearly every year of the 19th century and all over the world. It's still a problem in some places. So we're not alone. And what happens when you, you encounter these kinds of wide sweeping diseases, people flee. In Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, he depicts people leaving an Italian city for the countryside to escape plague. We have plague literature throughout history. And in fact, it's being written now uh, at, to deal with our own coronavirus. So what would Dickens do? 
he would tell stories just like we are, just like we're doing now. And in fact, live theater has had to change the way they tell stories. We're not going to the theater anymore. We're watching it. We're watching it live. We're watching it recorded. We're recording talks about theater. This is a brand new world in a really great way because we're still connecting through story. Dickens was a master storyteller in the 19th century. Here is a collectible Charles Dickens. We have Pokemon cards, we have baseball cards, trading cards. Harry Potter had uh, wizard cards and the chocolate frogs. The Victorians had carte de visite uh, cards and they would collect these famous authors, famous actresses, actors, the royalty, famous political figures, uh, war heroes, and they would keep them in memento, in memento books. And this is Dickens. He was very popular. We're going to talk about how popular in a little bit. Here he is a little younger. And one of the things that you need to know about him is he never stopped working. He was a workaholic, partly because he grew up very, very poor. His family did not ascend to even the ranks of the middle class exactly, though he didn't always come from poverty. His father, though, was not great with money and ended up in debtor's prison. And back in Dickens' youth, debtor's prison was a place you went to live with your family until you could figure out a way to get debt free. Often they would leave one person outside debtor's prison to work. And they did that to Charles when he was just about 11 years old. His entire family is in debtor's prison and he went to work in a boot blacking factory by himself in horrific conditions. If you wonder what that was like for him, you only need read David Copperfield to get a sense of the loneliness, despair and fear that he felt having to live on his own manage money on his own, buy his own clothes, feed himself, and work in, in horrifying conditions. But because of that, he pulled himself out of poverty by learning how to be a court reporter. And he did an amazing job at that. And from there, he parlayed that into journalism and then publishing and then novel writing. And we are celebrating one of his great stories, A Christmas Carol. Here's some other pictures of Dickens. He worked throughout his entire life, rarely stopping. Even when he would take vacations with his family, he took a trip to the United States. They went to Europe and he wrote books about it because, you know, he needed to make money. This is his wife, Catherine Hogarth, before and after 10 children. Now, 10 children doesn't seem like a lot for the Victorians, but having 10 children that survived is quite a, an accomplishment. And that means that that's 10 children surviving who are constantly eating. It's very expensive. Now, it was a very productive marriage but it wasn't necessarily successful. And we'll talk about that in a little while. It's a very scandalous and it begins in the early part of their marriage. Catherine's younger sister, Mary, started to live with them shortly after they uh, set up their first home and she was really angelic and pretty and she was not very healthy. Maybe she had the tuberculosis. She died in Dickens' arms. He was distraught. He said, I must be buried with her. Kind of a little strange, maybe, for feel that way about your sister-in-law. Also, he took a ring from her finger upon her death and wore that ring for the rest of his life. I'm just saying. <laughs> we, need to, we need to think about that a little bit. So it, productive marriage, maybe not totally successful. There's another sister that comes into it later. So just wait, it's gonna get, it's gonna get even more interesting. Here's Dickens and his family and friends. So the red arrow points to Dickens himself lounging in the front, kind of in charge, 
not stressing out. The blue arrow points to one of his best friends, Wilkie Collins, who comes into this story a little later. Also very exciting guy with an interesting marriage or two. And then the green arrow points to Dickens' oldest son, who when Dickens split from his wife was the one of 10 children that went to live with his mother. All the other nine children went to live with Dickens, including Catherine's other sister. What? <laughs> it's very complicated. Dickens grew up and matured as photography did as well. So not only do we have paintings and sketches of Dickens early in his life, we actually have photographs. So we can see early in his life and then later in his life. The very haired years and then the comb over years. And this is the celebrity mugshot years. This just cracked me up. I love this picture of him. It reminds me of that horrible celebrity mugshot of Nick Nolte. And I like to think that if they did that kind of thing, and if Dickens was ever arrested, it would kind of look like this. <laughs> now, we're going to get to the really juicy part. So he had a wife. He kind of loved the wife's younger sister a little bit. And then when he split with the wife, the wife's other sister stays with him and the kids. But <gasps> he also had a girlfriend. OK. So when he turned 45, he had been throughout his life very productive in creating theatrical productions all over England to raise money for good causes. And because he was a natural born entertainer and storyteller, he would perform in other plays, one in particular, a play um, by Ben Johnson he loved. And he wrote one. And when he performed in one, he met Ellen Turnan, a young 19-year-old actress. He was 45, she was 19. So in Hollywood, that's nothing. In the Victorian era, it's kind of nothing. He was a little uptight about the possibility that his fans would find out about this affair or relationship but he didn't help things by publishing a letter, publishing a letter talking about how his wife had always been just a little nutty and maybe it was okay for a husband to find something else to do. There's a lot more to that story, but you've got the gist. Here he is looking contemplative and interested in what his muse might have to say, whether that's Catherine or Ellen or Mary or Georgina, the other sister, we don't know. He loved to be depicted working because that was really, as I said before, where he found his identity. He worked all the time. There is almost no point in his life when he didn't work. The day he experienced what they believe is a stroke and died, he was writing that day. So when he wasn't writing though, he was forcing his friends to go on these long death marches all over London and the countryside, wherever he was, in Switzerland, Italy, in the United States, he walked wherever he could go to ride a horse. He always wanted to be on the go. And part of his discomfort with staying still was a quest to understand that was, which was around him. He observed very keenly when he became a court reporter, when he was a young child on his own, living in London, working in a boot blacking factory. You have a lot of time to observe. And that became a habit. You'll see when he depicts his characters, they are very detailed. A lot of scholars will call his some of his characters stock or flat characters, and I would disagree with that. I think that he brings a lot of life and detail to his characters, even the less important characters. You will get something from his writing of them, if only in the way he names them, you'll get something of who they are and what they mean to the story. Here he is reading a little later in his life. He loved pictures of himself when he was reading because he didn't have a lot of formal education. And it meant something to him that he had gotten to a place where his words 
and learning could be shared with others and was valued. Now, here's an interesting thing I was so surprised to learn about when I first started studying Dickens. He was mobbed when he went places by crowds. They pulled his hair out <laughs> and they came at him, him with scissors and little knives to cut pieces of his clothing away so that they could take a souvenir. So he was like the 19th century Elvis or the Beatles or NSYNC or One Direction or BTS. And I just wanna point out in this picture, the odd shape of his beard. I'm wondering if maybe he had a fan encounter that went sideways. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Maybe a bad day, just anyway. Um, he loved his fans. He loved to be adored, but it was also frightening. In one hotel, he had a meet and greet with fans in the United States and they crowded so far into the room, he was pushed into a corner and he could hardly breathe. He feared for his life um, on that same trip. This is just before he started to write A Christmas Carol. He and his wife were staying in a cabin outside New York and they woke up in the morning and it was a beautiful sunny day and they couldn't wait to go see, I think they were gonna go see Niagara and they woke up and there are all these faces pressed to the windows in their cabin. <laughs> People had <laughs> found out where they were staying and they, they stalked them. So very uncomfortable. Um, and, and that may be why Dickens finally decided to move to a giant house in the country. <laughs> this is Gad's Hill. When he was younger, he used to walk by this house with his father and just wish that one day he could own it. And his father said, if you work really hard, one day you could buy this house. And that is exactly what happened. In the house, Dickens had a study where he wrote a lot of his later books. And he loved this etching of himself in that study. He very much looks like the gentleman. Of course, he's not. He is not a conventional gentleman by any definition. But his ability to tell a story, his innovation in publishing, and his marketing of his own work really transformed who he was. And in fact, one time the queen wanted to meet him and he made her wait. Like five minutes, he made the queen wait. That's big. And she didn't even get mad. She was like, yeah, okay, I'll wait for Dickens. When he died, this is the sketch that a lot of newspapers ran because it was uh, understood Dickens, that Dickens sitting in his chair in his study, that was an iconic image for his time. If you asked anyone who Charles Dickens was, they would know. If you mentioned the name Charles Dickens, they would know who you were talking about. He was so well known that the youngest child, it, chimney sweep, urchin, pickpocket, um, homeless, to a fallen woman, to the queen, to royalty all over the world, they knew who he was. As soon as books could be shipped, they were shipped. He was beloved everywhere he went. And when he wrote A Christmas Carol, it just got better. In 1842, he had gone to the United States and he had learned uh, many, many things about American culture that he didn't know. When he came back to, the, uh, to London, he started to write Martin Chuzzlewit, a book that takes place in America. It wasn't doing great. Up to that time, pretty much everything he had written would be what we would call blockbusters. He was the Stephen King or the JK Rowling of that era. If he wrote it, people were getting it. He was publishing in parts and per in periodicals, making his text available at less cost than ever before so that it could be available to every level of society. And that wasn't always the case with every author prior to his era. So he did a lot of innovation in publishing. 
So Martin Chuzzlewit was not the blockbuster that his previous works had been, and his publishers were thinking of lowering his salary. And he already had a ton of kids, and he already had a lot of expenses. So he was a little panicked about that. When he started to write A Christmas Carol, it was partly because of need. He was worried. He had been genuinely hungry and genuinely without, and he didn't want to be there again. So he, come on, I need another story. Let's go. <laughs> and this came to him, he said, all of a sudden. And when he wrote it, he says he wrote it in a fever or a daze, almost a, a ghostly experience. And that's perhaps how it came to be that there it's a ghost story as much as it is anything. It was published in December of 1843. This just happens to be the same Christmas that Queen Victoria depicted here with uh, Albert. She sent out her first queenly Christmas card. So these two things together really made Christmas special in London that year. Dickens published, he used a lot of his own money to publish this book, by the way. It wasn't just something he wanted to give to the publishers because he wanted more profit because he needed that profit. He published 6,000 copies with four full color illustrations. And I'll talk about that in just a second. As soon as they, he, they were published, it sold out almost immediately. By January 1844, he had to publish another 7,000, sold out pretty quickly, again, had to publish more and more. And it's never been out of print since then. Within a month of publication, it had been pirated and adapted for the stage. Sometimes Dickens was like, no, go, on, go for it. <laughs> Sometimes Dickens was involved in the productions. He would uh, consult or um, at least talk to the cast or, or give notes. Sometimes he was directly involved, but uh, there was also a lot of pirating of his books. In fact, one of the reasons that he tours in the United States twice is because there was no copyright law protecting his works in the US. So he did not get money if his works were published by United States off, uh, publishers. But he could make money by touring and reading his books aloud, giving special readings in the US. Toward the end of his life, his last tour, he made 19,000 pounds. And to give you a sense of what that would be, you could pay for someone to work for you full time to be your servant to cook and clean and help you get dressed and take care of you and manage a huge portion of your life for 16 to 20 pounds a year. And he made 19,000 pounds. So he did pretty well later on, but that's partly due to his own willingness to work. When you open a Christmas Carol, they were beautifully made books. He didn't want them to be cheap feeling or to look cheap. He wanted this book to be special. And it was. You open it up and there is Mr. Fezziwig and a depiction of Mr. Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig dancing at their ball. And then you get the whole Victorian title, A Christmas Carol in prose, being a ghost story of Christmas by Charles Dickens with illustrations by John Leach. We call it A Christmas Carol, but it's more than that. And in his preface, Dickens says, uh, talks about it being this little ghostly tale, and he hopes that you'll find uh, joy in it and not put it away. John Leach was a trusted illustrator of Dickens. He didn't always trust illustrators. And in fact, this is one of the areas of publication that he revolutionized. His first work, Pickwick Papers, when he was hired to write Pickwick Papers, the publisher said, well, the illustrator will give you illustrations and you can create the story. And Dickens said, no. <laughs> he's, he's this, he's never written a novel before. He's never written anything substantial. And he just said, no, that's not how it's going to be. I'm going to write the story and the illustrator is going to follow me. 
And in fact, that's what happened. I guess sometimes you just have to say how it's going to be. And so from then on, Dickens controlled who his illustrators were going to be. And he really loved John Leach. And John Leach was very popular. It created thousands and thousands of illustrations in his life. He originally studied to be a medical doctor, but then I think that was sort of family pressure, but then decided, no, I really want to be an artist and I can do it. And he did. So he wrote in uh, satirical journal Punch or published cartoons and illustrations in that for other novelists and lots of periodicals. And these are the eight illustrations that he created for the original Christmas Carol. There were four black and white and four full color. To do full color in that era was incredibly expensive because they had to be hand colored. 6,000 copies, four color illustrations a piece. That's a lot of time and a lot of work. Although people were really cheap back then. So it, it relatively speaking, it didn't cost a lot of money, but it did take a lot of time. And you'll see here a lot of images that if you're not familiar with the text itself, you may not recognize because these are not parts of the story that are always part of every adaptation. But I highly recommend that you read the entire story. It takes about three and a half hours to get through the entire book. Uh, Tim Curry has recorded the entire book on Audible. There's a couple of recordings on Audible that are great, but Tim Curry's is really fantastic. I think, Susan, you mentioned another one. I can't remember. Um, but it, it, just listening to it is a remarkable experience. And you, if you keep these illustrations in mind, it's really worth uh, digging deep and going through all of those things. You'll see here, these are the phantoms to the left and then innocent uh, ignorance and want that come from uh, one of the spirits, uh, young children that Scrooge is just mortified to meet. Here on the left, Scrooge is putting the cap back on the spirit of Christmas present. Past. Or past, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Presents, all party, you know, fabulous. Uh, God, this is Christmas past. And then on the right, Scrooge is enjoying a little tipple with Bob Cratchit. Obviously, this is the end of the book. Um, the, the, the illustrations, as I'm showing to you, are, they are not in order uh, how they appear in the book. Um, to the left is Marley's ghost, and then uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig at the ball. And then here you see, oh, this is, um, I love Ghost of Christmas Present. He's such a party animal with his green robe and his fabulous uh, wreath and his uh, torch. I just love it. It's so rich. Um, and then on the right, this is the, the ghost of Christmas future pointing down at the Ebenezer Scrooge grave, the last of the spirits. Dickens did a lot to promote a Christmas carol. Unlike authors today who are able to go on talk shows or um, books, do book signing tours, there was not that kind of apparatus uh, and system available to Dickens. So what he did is he booked readings, performances, and he would read specific sections of his books, not just a Christmas Carol. He read a, a Christmas Carol over 120 times in public or parts of it. He read many, many parts of uh, several of his novels. A favorite scene of his was the murder of Nancy and Oliver Twist, but he was so fatigued afterwards, he, he would sometimes collapse off stage. And I reminded of James Brown, you know, when he's saying, I feel good. And, and then he's, he's so exhausted, he just collapses on stage. Well, Dickens, Dickens would put that much effort into it. And, and his doctors even told him later in his life, dude, you can't keep doing this. This is wearing you down. He said, no, no, I got to appease my fans. I have to go out there because really he was kind of a rock star. And, but giving these readings allowed more people to learn about his works than ever before. So being able to put the author and the author's reading with the text itself was very meaningful for his audience members. In fact, he was so popular 
that these readings would be standing room only. People would sneak in the back. They would sneak in, in the back of the stage. They would sit in the aisles. There was no fire code. So they would just be hanging from the balcony. And then there would be people all in the lobby and waiting outside. And, <laughs> and they would whisper, oh, he's doing the reading from Oliver Twist now. It's Oliver Twist. It's Oliver Twist. It's Oliver Twist. And throughout the crowd, then people would know, oh, he just read Oliver Twist. Even though they couldn't hear him, they were so so excited to be part of that experience. Um, you can kind of understand why they would want to snatch some of his beard hairs and cut off his clothing. I'm not saying that's okay, but you know, I get it. Uh, in fact, uh, he was so he continued to be so popular that in 1901, <laughs> A Christmas Carol was the topic of a film. You can still see this online. If, if you Google this and go to YouTube, that's where I got this, this image. It's called Scrooge or Marley's Ghost. And it's the oldest film of uh, Christmas Carol adaptation, but there are loads and loads and loads of films. These are just a few from 1938 to 2009. And I promise you there was one every single year from 2009 to 2020, a television miniseries, a full film, Every single year, theaters around the world produce various different kinds of A Christmas Carol. I know Alabama Shakespeare Festival has done some really wonderful ones. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what year it was, Susan, but there was a musical Christmas Carol yes. and I gave a talk. Was it 2010? Around there, yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was fabulous. And the um, part of the stage circled around. Yeah. Oh, it was just marvelous. So not just. Nothing, nothing says a Christmas Carol by Dickens like dancing <laughs> zombies, I always say. You know? Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can, you can make Christmas Carol into anything. Mm -hmm. The idea of the being prepared by some ghostly person that you know for the next few ghosts and, and something is gonna be transformative, you'll be shocked. This is a story that's told over and over and over again. Whether they give Dickens credit or not, it's, it, is a, it is a way to tell a story now. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here are some of them. I particularly love Patrick Stewart. Of course, I love Patrick Stewart and everything. Um, he could read the phone book, right? And then I would, I would be fine. <laughs> there is a Mickey Mouse, a Barbie, an animal Christmas carol. There is a ballet. They have various different kinds of musicals. And Susan, you were just mentioning the zombie yeah. Christmas carol. A kind of perfect for pandemic. Um, <laughs> where, where's that one? And it, it, it doesn't stop every single year. This is something that's celebrated. In fact, when I was younger, I participated in a Christmas Christmas Carol because that happened in my town. My friends were involved in a community theater and they said, do you want to do something? I said, sure, I'll sew costumes. <laughs> I think we put it on in a gas station. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. Well, the great thing is it's out of copyright right? You're not yeah. violating any law. You can take it and do whatever you want with it. So it gives people an op, it gives anybody an opportunity to adapt it to their time and for their purposes to make story meaningful, to make that human connection. And that is what this book is about. So sometimes you get really crazy, crazy things like zombie, a Christmas carol. And sometimes you just get a rom-com Christmas Carol riff, and it doesn't go so great. The idea is super, but 28% mm, mm -hmm. approve of the critics, 40% of the audience. Probably, audience is probably approving because they had great food to eat while they were watching it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. It, it <laughs> so sometimes there's a misstep, but then sometimes <laughs> there's something really amazing. So here is what, yeah, here's what ASF is doing. And I'm so proud to live in a community where our Alabama Shakespeare Festival has figured out a way to deal with the isolation and disconnectedness that we are all feeling in COVID. 
theaters everywhere are figuring out new ways to do this. And Greta Lambert, who I understand is celebrating 35 years at ASF. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable. Okay. She has undertaken a one person Dickens Christmas Carol. And the information is here. You can go to the website and figure out how to pay the $15 so your household can watch it. Um, great reviews, really wonderful, beautiful costumes, just a remarkable performance. And the theme of A Christmas Carol is overcoming isolation. Whether it is self-imposed isolation as we see in Scrooge or if it is isolation that you cannot help. It is about reconnecting with your community, with your family, with people you haven't talked to in years forming better, stronger relationships, letting go of the fear. One of the reasons I love this book so much every year, and I swear every single time Scrooge wakes up the next morning and he's like joyful, I just cry. I cry. <laughs> <laughs> when I was listening to Tim Curry reading, it was like, <laughs> it's just crazy. I've read this book, I don't know, 30 times. And I don't know how many productions I've seen, how many times I've heard it read. And every single time I'm just filled with that kind of tingly relief that there is hope no matter how bad this year was, Scrooge made it through one more time. Yeah. He's going to be okay. T Tiny Tim's not going to die. The family's not going to be ruined. This Scrooge is going to be with his nephew. Oh my gosh. And he's going to have a wonderful Christmas every single year after this. And that is the joy of A Christmas Carol. The theme is bringing families back together. It is about overcoming greediness and finding generosity. It is about overcoming isolation and making connection happen. And that is the most important thing that we need right now is figuring out how to keep those connections alive. And this is a story that does that. Not only can you share it with your family in isolation because you can pay $15 per household. I don't think there's a theater ticket in the world <laughs> that is that equivalent. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure there are theater tickets for $15 for a single ticket anywhere. So this is, this is one of those things I, I'm just, I'm so proud of, of this event. Mm -hmm. And Dickens would be too, because anytime Dickens could do something to make money, he would be thrilled. <laughs> In fact, Dickens is money. <laughs> he is so popular. He got on money. This is amazing to me. And, but he would love this. He would absolutely love this. If Dickens were alive now, like I hinted before, he would have a house in London. He would have a house in Hollywood. He would be an entertainment mogul. He would be producing films of all his books. He would be uh, selling them to Amazon Prime, Netflix, Acorn, you name it. And he's going to be there and he's going to be doing it. He's going to be producing other people's works because he loved to mentor other writers. So his best friend, Wilkie Collins, he'll be producing movies. That of the books that Wilkie Collins had written, Elizabeth Gaskell's novels, absolutely, he'd take those too. He would be famous, just like he had been. In fact, he's so famous, he has a theme park. <laughs> Have you been? No, and I am telling you, I would go back to England just to do this. The last time I was there, it was such a rush to be, I was at an academic conference. It was entirely in the opposite direction. I didn't get a chance to do it, but you can Google Dickens World and there are wonderful videos on YouTube that will take you through. And it's dark and kind of reminiscent of a polluted Victorian era. <laughs> and there's a nasty I little- your Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic. So Dickens would, he would approve of this. This is Dollywood. Mm -hmm. This is Dickens world. He would totally have done this. As well, he would approve of his action figures. 
You can buy them online now for $41.39. I got mine for $9.99 when I got it. I got two in 2009. One, my son broke playing with it. Dickens had a terrible run-in with Optimus Prime and Optimus Prime One. <laughs> and Dickens, uh, Dickens quill broke. And so I had to go back and uh, uh, buy another one. I got it incidentally at the ASF gift shop where mm -hmm. I also got my Jane Austen, Edgar Allan Poe, Shakespeare and Einstein action figures. <laughs> I think the gift shop is closed now, but in the future when it opens up again, keep your eyes open. You may want to get there and, yeah. uh, and check out the gift shop. Also, Lego Holiday Charles Dickens, tribute to Christmas Carol. I'm not going to own it, <laughs> but I really want to. <laughs> I really, really want to. Okay, so Dickens, he would be all about read my stuff, man, buy my toys, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, catch me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. He would be on all those things. Mm -hmm. And he would be everywhere on every talk show. He would be the bee's knees. In fact, I like to think that he might have a reality show, kind of like keeping up with the Kardashians, but better. <laughs> because check it out. Mm -hmm. He's got 10 kids, mm -hmm. most of whom he's terribly disappointed with. <laughs> yeah. Two of his sons, he sends off to India where one dies the other one doesn't come home to London, but goes to Canada and ends up dying in Illinois. Another son goes into the Navy and becomes so debt ridden when he asks for money to help get out of debt, Dickens won't send it to him. He dies on the ship. He's not happy with the people that his children marry. He's estranged from his wife. He's got a girlfriend half his age his best friend, Wilkie Collins, and this will just slay you. His best friend, Wilkie Collins, has two families. And they live around the corner from each other. Spin off. <laughs> I know. Is that just nuts? He, it, he would, his reality show, Everybody Wants a Little Dickens, would run 20 years. Mm-hmm. Kardashians, 14 years. Pfft. Kardashians and Kanye West have nothing on Dickens and Wilkie Collins. <laughs> that's what Wilkins would do in the pandemic, or that's what Dickens would do in the pandemic. He would make connections. He would make money. He would find a way to power through because that's what he did. That's what he did through all kinds of outbreaks of cholera, his own illnesses. In 1865, he had a horrific experience on a train, crashed, and uh, many, many people were injured. It crashed in the middle of the night. Of course, there are no street lights. There's, there's no way to really see what's happening. And he is able to escape. He's with Ellen Turnin and her mother. And people are screaming and uh, things are, are falling off the tracks. And um, he's quite injured actually. And, but he manages to, he left a manuscript in the car. So he, he manages to get back on the train, grab his manuscript and get back out. So, you know, he has a lot of interesting things happen to him that he, it would be great story in a reality series. That's what he would be doing. He would be connecting us somehow. So that is my contextualizing A Christmas Carol and Dickens. We get so much from A Christmas Carol. God bless us, everyone. Bah humbug. Dead as a doornail. <laughs> yeah. Now, dead as a doornail is older than A Christmas Carol, but... It's famous in Christmas Carol. It's famous in Christmas Carol. And... Every year, I think a new generation gets introduced to A Christmas Carol, and they may not know all these details about Dickens, but it is so rich, and he's so wild. I just absolutely love seeing the story every year and learning about him, so 
I leave you all at the end of this presentation. Happy holidays, all the holidays. And here is a Victorian feast. <laughs> like this lecture's been. I should, as if I could eat a feast like that and I don't want more, but I'm that yeah. kind of listener. And it's without the goose. There's no goose in that. Oh, well, okay. Well, I gotta have some goose here. <laughs> so if you, let me ask a question that I really wanna, this is not a hard question for someone who studies Dickens, but I think it's something that a lot of people celebrate and wonder about in this story is his narrative voice, mm -hmm. which is the way he tells this story. Mm -hmm. is so powerful, so energetic. I mean, he's got this God, this character that only says bah humbug for pages. And yet the story is vibrant and detailed. And what is, is this the way he's told all his novels, all five or six to this point? Or is this a voice for Christmas Carol? He is, a lot, there's a rumor that's not true, by the way, that he was paid by the word. That's why his novels are so long. That is not true. Um, he was not paid by the word. If he had been paid by the word, he would have been richer quicker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is not why he was so wordy. He wanted, he very much comes from his court reporting days where he had to transcribe everything. Mm -hmm. And in journalism, he had to tell all of the details. Mm -hmm. So I think part of that influences him as an author, but he has an, a substantial, remarkable vocabulary. So when he describes a moment, he wastes no single moment with wishy-washy, lame, mm -hmm. muddled, words. It, it, he, want, he does not lack precision ever. And I think that's what makes his narrative voice so dynamic. It's not very repetitive. He uses new ways to describe different events, different moments, mm -hmm. and powerful, I think, because of that lack of similarity. It's, it's new and exciting. His characters are very distinct and he describes them in very distinct ways. Um, one character holds their hand just so with the fingers curved back and the other has, you know, a, so you all, and that is a master storyteller rather than, oh, the character used a, a hand to describe instead it's, it, so he's very precise like that. And I think that's part of his power as a narrator. And he's also so present as a narrator. Yes. He's yes. as present as Scrooge is. As he is. And I, I think the, the narrator, one of the reasons it's so easy to read this book and for people to read it aloud is because the narrator is such an important part of the story. Now, his narrator is not always this important. <laughs> Some, just sometimes it is. Um, but in a, in a book like David Copperfield, where David Copperfield is, it's told in first person and it's yeah, 14,000 pages, uh, it, it becomes a different kind of narration. It's a yeah. different kind of powerful. So in this case, I think it is his very specific use of a variety of vocabulary and moments describing very distinct characters. And he creates a Scrooge that is just scattered emotionally. Mm -hmm. And every range of emotion, Scrooge goes through it. Absolute elation to the most consuming devastation. And I think that makes the the, the narrative powerful. Mm -hmm. He's just happened to use your pun, just a dickens of a time. He is. <laughs> I mean, his Scrooge is so doer and yeah. Dickens is so alive. So 
twinkle in the eye the whole time. He is like Christmas present through the whole story. Just I agree. I agree. And I think the the reason the ending works so well is we see the narration infused in Scrooge. Mm -hmm. We see that same kind of twinkle, that joy, that uh, you know, leaning out of the window, yelling at people, hello, woo. <laughs> but he, he really joins the story. He know. does. He becomes, he transforms. And I think, oh man, don't we all wish we could do that? Don't we all wish we could have that kind of transformative moment where we leave behind the things that have we do that make us unhappy, the mm -hmm. choices that we've made that maybe not such great choices. This <laughs> is this is a story uh, for every one of us mm -hmm. who thinks we didn't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We made a bad decision and we're beating ourselves up because we did. Yeah. And now just let it go, man, let it go. It's a brand new day tomorrow. And somebody but a turkey and get on with it. Stop living in the past. Buy a cab for that turkey. <laughs> <laughs> While you're thinking about this too, comment about, he calls it a Christmas carol. He makes it musical. Yes. And yes. of course, in Victorian times, the dis rediscovery of the musical part of Christmas, mm -hmm. is back on, I mean, it's the late 1830s when Sandy starts publishing the old carols, but what is he doing with that in this story? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you notice in the, the book, they're not called chapters, they're called staves mm -hmm. or stanza or verses, like a song. And a Christmas carol is what you do to celebrate Christmas. It's the song you sing. And pretty typically we don't sing for ourselves, do we? No. The, the, we sing for others. And when we create a Christmas carol with a group of people, that is a gift for others. That's why people carol around neighborhoods. It is a gift. And this is his gift. It's a gift for Scrooge. It's a gift for the people in Scrooge's life. So that celebratory metaphor of song is about what this book is for is the purpose of this book. I mean, we, get, we get this sense of celebrating Christmas and Dickens just seems to fit right in with our version of, of Christmas so well. But in his time, this view of Christmas was really brand new. I mean, from yes. since, since 1652 or three or so when the Puritans outlawed the celebration of Christmas. Yeah, I didn't like said, that. You may not, it was a work day. You better yeah. be at work. You better be doing your puritanical thing to earn your salvation. But that's not by celebrating what they thought was not the birth of Christ, but a pagan holiday. Right. So Christmas got beaten away from the happy celebratory group time that it had been for so long in England, back to King Alfred and the 12 days of Christmas. But Dickens is part of this rejuvenation of not that everybody get together at the manor house, right? but refocusing it into what the Victorians would consider the important social group, the family, Fred's. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think um, I think it's like um, when the time is right, both Newton and Leibniz invent calculus. Yeah, I, I yeah. think a Christmas Carol comes the same year that Victoria sends out the first royal Christmas card with a Christmas tree, with the family standing around the Christmas tree with all the presents. That was not normal. Alfred brought the Christmas tree to England, and yeah. And so I think really uh, that, that confluence of social moments that begins to create something. Now, A Christmas Carol is not Dickens' only Christmas tale. No. He wrote one every year for many years after this, but this is the one that started it all. And this is the one that was put on stage immediately. And this is the one that was read to families first. So it has the sentimental value of coming the first time. 
the yeah. same time that our queen, our beautiful young mother queen is, uh, it's give birth, it doesn't, we don't know that she doesn't like children. Um, <laughs> nobody yeah. knows that. Till later. We are. We are, yeah, we gotta wait till the 20th century to read her biography to find out. Um, but that's not, that is not what we know as Victorians. Mm -hmm. And so this concept of being disconnected from family mm -hmm. is very real in the Victorian period. It was very easy to be disconnected. Families moving from the country to the city, from a farming life to an industrial revolution, manufacturing life, breaking apart families in ways that never could have been imagined. And here is a, a story that puts them back together again. Yeah. And the, I mean, London, and I was doing some rereading of just that kind of what is Victorian culture when Dickens was writing this story. And that sense of Christmas Carol coming in what is affectionately known in Victorian history as the time of troubles. Yes. And the fact that you've ridden this wave of industrial discovery because it, it happened in England first and yes. profits and all the changes that you just described in the culture. Oh, and yet yeah. many critics also comment about the fact that with all that energy and all that going on in the late 30s and certainly the 40s, you hit um, unemployment, crop failures, all sorts of things like this, where it suddenly goes wrong. Yeah. And that while they're riding the wave, there's also a sense that, and I'm quoting somebody, that there's the sense of something lost. That they, but they feel like displaced persons. And you were just talking about that with people going yeah. from the country to the city. They've never lived in cities before. There's no place for them in cities welcome slums welcome you know and, oh, yeah that, and you can really i'm fascinated by how you can feel that in a christmas carol scrooge's life there's something lost which he gets back he lives in a building that's mostly not used yeah or used for business it and it's mostly empty and uh, lonely and a little just if a building can be destitute rather than a person I think it could be um, <laughs> and yeah he's we see that it's very visceral that's the thing that Dickens does better than many 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 other authors um, I would say Elizabeth Gaskell does it as well as he does um, you feel where he places the story. You feel the cold, the desolation, the worry, the poverty, the hunger, the fear, the inadequate shelter, the pollution, the dirt, the, the grime. It's, um, and it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult place to live. London is not a pretty town in the 1840s. 1840s were rough. They were rough. By 1848, there are revolutions all over Europe. There are uprisings in England. The, the crown isn't, uh, there's no coup in England, but there's a lot of shuffling around all over the continent because it's a bad, bad decade. Industrial revolution without any kind of growth check. So everything is polluted. Everything is kind of grubby and dirty. And yeah, we have all this forward movement, but the payoff is not clear. It is not clear that this is a great way to go. It's just a way to go. Yeah. Working people can't vote yet. You've got yep. I mean, And until they pass the corn, uh, you know, did away with the corn tariff, mm -hmm. the, which is grain tariff, uh, corn is grain in England, that, you couldn't even buy a loaf of bread for, I mean, the poor people couldn't afford it. It's, it's an amazing time. It really is. And there's Dickens in the middle of it, looking at yeah. starving children yeah. saying, want and ignorance won't do. Mm -mm. And he does something about it. Unlike a lot of people of his era, he wrote Nicholas Nickleby 
to take a take a shot at corrupt schools mm -hmm. and something was done about it he complains about the pollution and the poor treatment of children something's mm -hmm. done about it you read hard times and you think oh my gosh how are they going to ever live through this industrial level revolution and the pollution he has a big voice and he uses it yeah. He creates homes for women who encounter difficult times. They were called fallen women. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't necessarily sexually fallen. They didn't all turn to prostitute. They could have stolen a loaf of bread and they would have been condemned to yeah. deportation just for that. And so he, he does a lot of charitable good. So despite, okay, yeah, he would make a great reality show. He's also a philanthropist and he understands what people need far more than many other people of his era because he was there, he was that kid. Now, as he became more famous, fewer and fewer people knew that he came from such an abject poverty uh, background. And he didn't necessarily want everyone to know that, but when he died, he had, uh, he, he told his biographer, his designated biographer, go ahead, go ahead and tell people they need to know because he knew how powerful that would be in terms of reform. And he was definitely a reformer. What, when you think about Dickens as an author, do you have like three favorite novels or do you love them all equally? Like I do Shakespeare's plays. I do, um, Tale of Two Cities, number one. That is, um, I, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times and the, the ending, I won't spoil it in case anybody wants to read it. It's one of the greatest epics ever written about war and about the human heart. It is every time, I mean, I'm just thinking about it. I get kind of all, oh, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> um, an just, author that can write Christmas Carol and write Tale of Two Cities as well. Oh, it's, it's, it's an epic, broad strokes, giant canvas of amazing storytelling. I would say another one of my favorites, Great Expectations. Mm -hmm. Just the story, uh, how Pip has to navigate the world and the people that he meets every single walk of life. It's just, it's absolutely incredible. And the plight of women in the 19th century, I think is nowhere writ better than Miss Havisham. <laughs> yes. uh, Stella. <laughs> Whoo. Another um, role Greta Lambert has played at ASF. Yeah. Miss Havisham. Uh, tough, tough roles. Um, so Tale of Two Cities. Oh, Oliver Twist. Mm -hmm. Man, when you get to that end and that murder scene is, I, I had not read Oliver Twist for years. And then I taught it in a Dickens class at AUM. And I was shocked at how powerful it was. So then when I had, um, I had read his biography and learned that, you know, he, when he read that part at public readings, he would be exhausted afterwards. And I thought, hmm please. No, I can totally understand. Now I was, as a reader, I was going, oh my God, oh my God. I couldn't believe how vivid and yeah. disgusting and frightening. And there's, there's one part of that murder scene where he describes the dog's footprints across the floor. He's tracked the blood Mm -hmm. in his footprint. Oh, it, it gave me the chills. It's it, hard it, to watch on stage in the musical Oliver. I'm remembering yeah. ASF's production of that. And that moment is Yeah. I, I would say those are, are maybe my top three, but I loved his last novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. He died after, you know, he was halfway through and he died. And it's such a good story. <laughs> so bitter when I taught that in a class I asked the students to finish it I said okay is, is, could we just please finish this story I don't care how we end it but we have to have an ending and I don't know that I told them it wasn't finished so, so it was the reading they're like 
what happened? We're, we're in the middle of something here. <laughs> um, recently, in the last uh, 10 years, I think there have been a couple novels that have addressed that. And uh, one novel, it's, uh, it escapes me who the author is right now. It, um, the action, the plot is they find the last six parts. It's very exciting. There's a stage version that did that about 20 years ago, I guess, an American stage version and where they, re they wrote two endings <gasps> and they, they don't tell the audience this, they get to the middle and now say, this is where Dickens stopped. Now, how do you want this to end? And the audience gets to decide every night, do you want this ending or this ending? And then they do it for them. I thought, yeah, that's that. letting it happen. You know, We cannot thank you enough for sharing the power of your love of Dickens and Dickens knowledge with us about this wonderful production at ASF. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Woodworth, for it's being such... here and sharing Dickens. This is the best on all levels. It's such an honor. It is such an honor. He was an amazing author. And I think there's a reason we still read him. I think so too. Then that is because we need these stories mm -hmm. still. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. What a God joy. Bless us, everyone. To talk to you. <laughs> Bye. Hi, ASF, thank you.